Behind me is Landis Farm, uh, an abbey located on an island just off the coast of uh, England in the North Sea, uh, about 70 miles north of the present day city of Newcastle upon Tyne. Um, pretty good sized city today uh, that was the Eastern terminus of Hadrian's Wall. Landis Farn was a center of Celtic Christianity and when it was attacked and looted by the Vikings in June 793 AD, this act sent shockwaves throughout all of Christendom. And it's this raid on Landisfarne that I wanna use as the point of departure for this final um, segment of the uh, presentation on war in the early middle ages. Let me put the, um, uh, put the, the screen up for you. Hmm, what happened there? There we go, okay. Now I kind of hate to give short shrift to the Norsemen or the Vikings, but we really need to get through the Middle Ages so we're gonna have to pick our targets. Uh, this again is an illustration of that famous raid on Landis Farn that I just discussed. Um, this raid sent shockwaves throughout all of Christendom. It is generally taken to mark the start of the Viking depredations that plagued Western Europe, especially Britain and the Western Frankish kingdom that we can soon start calling France. But not just Britain and France, the Vikings struck targets well into present day Russia and all the way around the Atlantic into the Mediterranean Sea by way of the Strait of Gibraltar. Uh, to, tie, to strike at targets in present day Italy. The secret of the Viking success wasn't numbers. It was their ability to strike from the sea at will anywhere. That in turn was a function of the longboat, also known as the long ship, a deceptive, simple, lo simple looking uh, vessel that was capable of surviving long voyages on the stormy Atlantic something that a Mediterranean galley couldn't begin to do. If you look carefully, you will see its rounded hull. It was later copied, this hull was later copied by the Spanish and the Portuguese when they built the caravel, a forebear of the galleon, as we'll see next week. The long boats that we know about were between 56 and 98 feet long with a length to width ratio of about seven to one. Their masts were as high as 52 feet and with a good wind could sail at an astonishing 10 knots per hour, that is to say almost 12 miles an hour, nearly four times the speed of Christopher Columbus's Santa Maria. But generally it depended upon its oarsmen, not its sails. And there might be as many as 30 men on each side and the longest long boats, sorry, the largest long boats had crews of between 70 and 80 men. The Santa Maria, by way of contrast, had a crew of just 40. Long boats were also shallow draft and could navigate in water as little as four feet deep. Now, Viking navigation techniques are not well understood, but we know that they were expert at getting from point A to point B beyond sight of land. We can guess that they were adept at gauging wind speed and the speed of ocean currents, could use observation of the stars and may have used a primitive astrolabe, which is a tool for determining latitude. We have confirmed that they made several voyages to North America, to a region that they called Vinland, which, the, which we think corresponds to present day Newfoundland, thus discovering America about 500 years before Columbus did. The Vikings not only struck targets on the coast, they routinely ranged far inland, capturing or attempting to capture a number of cities. In November, 885, they undertook a siege of Paris. They came in between 300 
and 700 long boats. Estimates of their strength range as high as 40,000 uh, Vikings, uh, 700 long boats times a crew of 70 each yields 44,000 men. So that's not an outlandish el estimate. The Frankish king, Charles III, also called Charles the Fat, is the grandson of Charlemagne, and he refused to take on the Vikings. Paris was saved by Odo, Count of Paris, who was commemorated in this painting in the Gallery of Battles at Versailles. The Vikings besieged Paris for 11 months unsuccessfully. They finally left, partly because they had little hope of breaching the defensive walls of Paris, and partly because Charles the Fat bought them off with 700 livres of silver, about $144,000. That pretty much wrecked Charles the Fat's reputation. And in 888, his nobleman, his nobleman removed him from the throne and elected Odo to rule instead. In 1898, a cousin of Charles the Fat, Charles the Simple, I'm not making these names up, assumed the throne after Odo's death. In 911, King Charles III of France ceded Normandy to the Norsemen in an attempt to buy them off. The Norse, the Norse, sorry, the, the Norse warlord Rollo, the Norse warlord Rollo, thus nominally became a, a vassal of the King of France. In reality, though, this gave the Norsemen an independent base from which to expand their power, which they did in 1066 AD by crossing the English Channel and conquering England. And this is a convenient point to terminate the early medieval era and turn our attention to war in the high Middle Ages. We'll look at that in our next presentation.